Invest Africa, proudly brought to you by KPMG. Transport infrastructure development continues to be a major concern on the African continent. A call has been made to African governments to accelerate reforms that will encourage more private sector investment in infrastructure projects. Pilani Nilunga has this report. The economic growth in sub-Saharan Africa continues to rise from 4.7% in 2013 to a forecast at 5.2% in 2014, this according to the World Bank. However, this might change due to the continent's inadequate infrastructure. East Africa's largest economy risks a rapid debt escalation as it has committed to borrowing billions of shillings to finance mega public infrastructure projects. Kenya's national debt is absolutely out of control, uh, you could argue unsustainable. 80% of Kenya's debt is odious debt, it has been um, the victim of uh, very serious corruption. Uh, allow me to say, uh, suffice to say that um, every Kenyan, including a newborn, owes in a national debt about Kenya shillings 30,000 each, that's about $400. Another region's influential economy, Tanzania has lost billions through poor transport infrastructure. This is delaying the country's economic growth, efficiency and competitiveness. The African Development Bank has it that Tanzania's ports, roads, railways, aviation systems and pipelines are in bad shape, and the worst of them is the port of Dar es Salaam. Tanzania Zambia Railways, one of the region's biggest post-independence infrastructure projects, is still overwhelmed by derailments and breakdowns after almost four decades in operation. AFDB suggests that public-private partnership is the key to revive the overstretched and dilapidated transport infrastructure in Tanzania. PPPs can help public sector entities achieve better value for their money and increase innovation in their infrastructure provision of services. Africa's poor infrastructure is slowing its economic development. However, according to the UN report, foreign investment is helping fill in some of the gaps. Economic expansion in sub-Saharan Africa is projected at 5.4% next year and 2016. Pilani Nyalonga, CNBC Africa. Johannesburg. Joining me now in studio to discuss transport infrastructure investment is Andrew Maggs. He's an independent research analyst at Andrew Maggs Consulting. Richard Matchett, Divisional Director at WSP Civil and Structural Engineers. And in our Lagos studios, we are joined by Kunle Elibute. He's a partner and head of advisory service at KPMG in Nigeria. Gentlemen, thank you so much for making the time to join us. Maybe to start off with making that connection, uh, mm. if you will, between uh, transport infrastructure and economic growth. Well, to me, um, the economy is going to have to grow on a framework, um, just like you would grow any system uh, around a framework of infrastructure. And transportation is probably the key to unlocking a country's potential. Mm. So, Richard, we've heard from the insert, I mean, Andrew, we've heard from the insert and what Richard is saying now about the importance of uh, transport infrastructure in the economy. But what is the state of play right now in Africa? Well, I'd support what Richard says. And um, if you look at the um, two principal functions of transport infrastructure. Um, I mean, there are many, but the standout ones for me, um, it's creating greater regional integration mm. um, and then also facilitating trade. Now, um, if you refer to uh, the program for infrastructure development in Africa, PEDA being the acronym, um, they've conducted a study to um, you know, see where Africa stands in terms of its transport uh, infrastructure and delivery. And uh, regrettably, um, it's failing in those two respects, regional integration and facilitating trade. And uh, just by way of example, if you look at the Trans-African um, Highway System, which comprises, I think it's nine corridors, and it's about 60,000 kilometers worth of, of highway network, um, only about 40, or about 40% 40 of that is either dysfunctional or it's lacking in entirely. So that I think illustrates the mm. the, the state of, of play and also the challenge mm. you know, going forward. Kunle, let's get an idea of uh, the, the situation in Nigeria, especially when we're looking at a country that is sitting pretty as the, with the biggest GDP on the continent. Would you say that the transport infrastructure is perhaps taking away from uh, bigger growth that Nigeria could be experiencing? Absolutely, the, and the infrastructure in, in Nigeria uh, for, for transport it, it's very it's very old. It's very uh, you know it's archaic. It, it needs uh, you know very serious investment in roads, 
in airports, in railway lines, uh, in, in new ports. Uh, the capacity of the infrastructure cannot essentially uh, foster the kind of growth we're looking for. And therefore, you have massive congestion on, the, on, the, on, on this infrastructure. And lack of maintenance also means that the infrastructure is, is, you know, is, is almost you know, at, at breaking point. Mm. But you know, just to go back to the point of my earlier colleagues on, on, this, on this discussion, one of the key challenges about in Africa, the infrastructure that has been in place historically was put there by the, by the, by the, by the, by the colonial mm. uh, in the countries, whether it be French or the English or the Portuguese. And the infrastructure was put in place to suit their purpose, which was to suit the import of, of, of commodities from, you know, export of commodities from Africa and the imports of finished goods from, from, from the Western world. So, the imp again, the other challenge about the infrastructure in Africa for transport purposes is that it's not integrated to facilitate trade amongst African countries. Mm. Uh, and that is a big, that's a big gap. So, if we really want to have trade amongst African countries, we, we need to reorient, reor reorientate the infrastructure to actually link the countries together to facilitate trade across, across, the, across the continent. How realistic is that uh, proposition to rearrange uh, the infrastructure network of a continent in essence such that it doesn't uh, reflect some of those colonial legacies of the past? <laughs> uh, yeah, let's rephrase the question. We need to do it. Um, whether it's realistic or not, some things are very difficult. I just remember back to when cell phones first came out and we thought, how realistic is it to have a, a pocket-sized phone in everybody's pocket. Yeah. Most people have two or three. Um, Africa has to develop. Um, its road network has to be improved. Its rail network has to be improved. And it has to happen across borders. Mm. We're already seeing um, in the SADC region um, a lot of effort to try and uh, unify standards, unify rail gauges, for example, so that railways can cross borders. Um, we're seeing the advent of um, one-stop border posts um, being planned and, and strategized to try and understand that. Those things have to happen. Um, Africa as a continent is incredibly rich in wealth. But let me interject. Uh, mm. Let me interject. I mean, I think we can have the world's optimism about what we need to be mm. doing in Africa, but without the funding, and maybe allow you, Andrew, to take mm. this on, without the funding, none of this can happen. And we're sitting at a funding deficit for infrastructure. If I've got my figures uh, right, that's 40 billion US dollars per annum. That's what we should be investing. That's critical. I mean, without the funding, and we can discuss the sources of that funding in a moment, but without the funding, you can't, you can't construct the, yeah. the, the infrastructure. But just to quickly pick up on a point that Richard uh, uh, raised, um, there's just got to be a coordinated effort, you know, whether it pertains to, you know, port to road rail, and uh, unfortunately, I think there are too many examples in the past where you've seen um, individual countries pursuing um, development agendas in isolation. Mm. And um, I think we've got to move away from that, and there's, there's got to be a more coordinated approach which can allow greater cross border installation mm. of infrastructure. Going back to the funding, um, funding in Africa is still dominated by multilateral lending institutions, something from the World Bank and its various um, uh, uh, the, the institutions within the bank group that, that, that make it up. Um, and also on the bilateral side, the World Bank being the major player. And I think it's, I'm under correction, but I think um, last year, around about 22% of its uh, disbursements um, in Africa went into the transport sector. Um, and in total, I think it's about 8.3 billion. Um, that's their total the investment spend in infrastructure in, in Africa. What we're seeing, unfortunately, 8.3 billion over what period of time? Are we talking that's about an over, annual? That's uh, over a year. It's over a year. Yeah. 8.3 versus 40 billion that we need. And remember, that 8.3 is not just for infrastructure. Yes. Yeah. So um, you can see there's a there's a huge margin of difference there. Yeah. Could I, I, I perhaps want to bring back the question uh, yeah. that you raised as at the end of your comment and maybe throw it back at you. Let's take Nigeria as an example. Are we finding that, at least from a government point of view, there are policies that point to a rethinking of transport infrastructure and, in particular, a political will to put the money behind the plans for transport infrastructure? Okay, let me, let me answer the question in, in a different, different, uh, different approach. Now, to go back to the question of, 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 of the lack of funding, funding will only, will only, will only follow projects that are bankable. So the key thing, therefore, is if you want funding from, from private sector or for funding from non sort of non World Bank type uh, financing, you need to make those you know, those projects bankable. Now that then 
dovetails back to your question about what government, po what government policy must be in place to make transport infrastructure bankable. It's fairly simple. I mean, if, if there's a traffic, if, if the traffic numbers are there to, to, for an airport to be concessioned or for a port to be concessioned or for a road network across the borders to be built, then the government needs to ensure that, you know, they need to de-risk the sector. I need to put the place in policies to make the, those, those, those assets bankable enough for funders, for, 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 for funding to come into place. Now, I mean, there's, there's one new project in, in Nigeria, which is a, a second Niger bridge across the river Niger. And even though the traffic study has been done, the government has to guarantee the traffic numbers for the first two or three years after the bridge is, is completed to, be able to, to, to ensure that the funding will, will, will follow the project. And if the, if the traffic is not, is not adequate, then the, the government has to do a top up Mm. after the bridge is, is, is up and running. Uh, and, that, and that bridge will, will bring traffic towards it, you know, if the, if the, if the toll prices and the tariffs are, are, are correct. So the bigger question about regional, regional integration and, 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 help and making countries work together is that today in West Africa, for example, we don't need visas to go up to, to travel across countries. But we see have border posts. So trucks can't get through. You know, trucks have to spend eight to 10 hours at the border post just to clear the goods. Mm. Which is unrealistic. So beyond the visa issue, we need to, you know, we need to de-risk the border posts and make the border posts f smooth enough to facilitate movement of goods and, and, and people across the borders. Now, once that happens, you know, then inf investors will come and say, "I can do a road because I know that you know, the road will be faster than, than air travel." But, but if, it takes, if it's Lagos to Ghana, it takes two days by road. Or 45 minutes by air, why should I invest in the road? Kunle, I feel like we've been having this conversation. If we go back to whether it's the OAU or the African Union, the integration of, uh, of African markets has always been a, a point that has been talked about extensively. And yet it's 2014 and we're still having the same conversation. So where's the problem? A absolutely. The problem is, is, one, is two sides. One is, one is governments who have allegiances to their old colonial masters. So the Francophone region tends to work with, the, with France. And until they, they understand that for their own future has to be in their hands and therefore cooperate with Ang Anglophone Africa better, we're not going to move. You know, the Portuguese keep on working with Portugal, mm. OK? You know, and, and so on and so forth. Let's, you know, let's and the take, Anglophone let, countries keep working with the British. Let's take a couple so, of comments from you know, Johannesburg. Until, until we'll actually before we go to the break. Let's take a couple of comments from Johannesburg before we go to the break. Maybe starting with you, Andrew, and then we'll come to you, Richard. I'd add to that quickly by saying I think there's still a, uh, a fear or concern by African governments to truly liberalise the transport sector. And I think um, certain assets, whether it be you know, ports or airports, are still perceived as being uh, you know, crown jewels. And uh, uh, th there's reluctance to, to let those out to private operators and owners. Um, so I think that, that still stands as an impediment. And then also to pick up what uh, Kunle Kunle spoke of about making sure you've got projects which are bankable. And um, I think of, you know, with our, within our clientele, um, and that comprises construction companies, consulting engineers who are keen to participate in these projects, but frequently um, they are not scoped properly. And then, of course, there's the problem of mm. actually processing these investments. And I guess this is up uh, uh, Kunle Street providing adequate transaction advisory services right. to then make these projects happen. Richard, I know you've got a comment, but I also want you perhaps to take on this question or this mm. theme that seems to be coming up, that it's not a question of the availability of funds. It's a question of bankability. Bankability in terms of a financial return? Um, sure, that's always going to be an issue, and I think whenever we're looking at a, at a uh, concession-based approach or a triple P-based approach, we have investors investing for a return. Sure, but one of the questions that we have to ask ourselves as a continent also is: Are we st are we not still in an expenditure need, where we still don't have the basic infrastructure to be able to feed into? You can have a, a toll concession on a road, for example. But if your connectivity from the ends of that road to into the city are not strong enough, you won't be able to produce um, the traffic mm. required to pay the bills. So there, there is always a critical mass of support infrastructure for your primary infrastructure. Now, when we talk about transportation infrastructure, we're talking ra um, rail, ports, major roads. Um, that's all very well, and oftentimes those get designed and, and positioned around your primary movement of goods and services. But we have to take it beyond just those um, key economic players into mm. the society as well.
And unless we start in our infrastructure planning, building in a certain societal resilience that can build economies, we're always going to be reliant on donor funding, mm. on um, large triple P's, etc. We've got to get to a point as a continent where we are self-sufficient. And I think that needs to be a long-term goal. It's, it's not a, a quick fix, unfortunately. Yeah. But that has to be part of the discussion, I, I believe. And on that note of self-sufficiency, let's take a short break. When we come back, we pick up the conversation where we'll be looking at rail, port, road and air infrastructure as we look at the, at the broader transport infrastructure state in Africa. We'll see you in two minutes. Welcome back. You're still watching Invest Africa. Remember that we do value your suggestions and your feedback. So send us an email. That's to investafrica at abn360.com or talk to us on Twitter. Uh, our show's hashtag is Invest Africa, or you can also follow at NBC Africa or follow myself at Nozi Pombanja. Still with me, I have my guest, Andrew Max, an independent research analyst at Andrew Max Consulting, Richard Matchett, divisional director at the WSP Civil and Structural Engineers, and Kunle Elabute, part and Head of Advisory Service at KPMG, joining us from our Lagos studios. Welcome back, gentlemen. Now, we've seen a couple of deals uh, on the South African front and indeed continentally. And maybe, Richard, let's get you to comment on this one first, in particular in the rail space. Lots of criticism uh, leveled from the South African audience at Transnet for the interplay between foreign players and domestic players. Is there a balance that can be struck? Well... Let's start off looking at the, the criticality of the rail and its need in terms of um, us being able to um, export. Um, very, very important. Um, without talking too much on the deals, I think one of the, one of the big things um, to remember is without being able to move the freight, without being able to move the goods, it's um, we won't be able to, to function in the mining space. Um, in, in terms of what, front, what Transnet is doing mm. um, in unlocking those corridors and also linked in with um, a move towards be more beneficiation um, on home soil. Yeah. I think the bigger picture is improving our economy um, and enabling more jobs through technology transfer, through um, secondary industry, all of those very good moves. Yes. I was going to say, looking beyond South Africa, and I think it's becoming increasingly difficult for rail to compete against road transport. And um, I think over the last 15 years, I mean, you look at the you know, uh, freight volumes, passenger volumes as well, um, Africa compared to the rest of the world. Um, in terms of freight volumes, I mean, it's, you know, uh, it's uh, probably just under 10%. Passenger volumes are falling. Um, and what we were talking about before the break in terms of um, you know, uh, putting more infrastructure in the mm. hands of the private sector, I mean, there are plenty of examples of, of uh, private rail operators. Uh, but many of those um, concession projects are fragile. Um, they're running on outdated infrastructure, um, not sufficient ballast. You look at the signaling systems attached to these railways, they're inadequate. So, um, of course, it still plays a very important mm. part uh, in terms of the bigger transport picture. Right. Um, but it's, um, I, I think it's going to become increasingly difficult to in, in, entice private investment into that uh, yeah. sector. Kunle, uh, we, we're talking about public-private partnerships right now, and in particular the incentives that uh, uh, should be in place to attract uh, private sector capital to come into these uh, projects. Give us an, a Nigerian example, and maybe if there are any best-case uh, examples from outside of, uh, outside of the continent where there's been a very good balance between attracting the, the, the private sector to come in while still maintaining uh, relative ownership by the state, if that's at all possible. Well, the best example I can give you in Nigeria is, is, is in the port sector, where all the ports in Nigeria were concessioned about, uh, say, about six, seven years ago. Um, Lagos, Port Harcourt, Calabar, all the ports were concessioned. Lagos on its own had th three ports, a um, couple of container ports, and the rest of them are, are, are open terminals. Now, what's happened is that, it, again, there was a big concern from government that revenue streams from these assets will drop if the, the Nigerian Port Authority let go. But what has happened is that not only has revenue streams gone up, the ports are more efficient. Uh, AP Mala was one of the biggest port operators globally, has invested over $20 million in the Apapa container port. And as a result of the, that investment, you know, the, the number of vessels that are st stopping to, to drop off cargo has increased. And the, and the, only, the only 
logjam they have right now is a back-end infrastructure to get the goods out of the port uh, fairly quickly. Mm. So we've seen clearly that in the port area, uh, the, the whole PPP arrangement in the port area, private operators in the port area has been very, very successful. And as we speak, there is now a business case for at least one or two new ports in Nigeria, and that it takes about you know, four to five years for, for a port to come on stream. Mm. And those ports will not only address Nigeria alone, but also address you know, the, the regional traffic as well. So that's, that's one example. Another example I note on the cards as we speak is that for you to move a, a container from Lagos to Accra, Ghana, that container has to go to Rotterdam first, offloaded from the, from the vessel, sit in the port for two or three weeks, and then go, get back loaded onto a vessel coming back to Accra. So it takes 42 days from Lagos to Accra for, for a container. However, as we speak, there is a, a project where it's the, the, a, 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 for, marine, for a, a, a maritime um, shipping company yeah. that will move across the West Coast from Dakar down to Cameroon and back and pick up, pick up cargo from Cameroon all the way to Lagos, to Accra, to Lome, Accra, Abidjan, and back and forth. And the business case for that is very strong. There's traffic for that to happen. But then that, that means you need to have very large ports that will take large, 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 large vessels, yeah. drop the vessels off, and then there can be transshipment up the West Coast. So in the port area, we're seeing improvements. And we're not there yet for sort of, uh, traffic on the, on the West Coast, but it's, it's going to happen mm. uh, as the ports get more efficient. Well, it's certainly um, that's one clear example. But yeah. Yeah, let me jump in there, Kunle. It certainly sounds like there are some examples on the continent that are working well. But maybe let me throw the question here, and, and anyone can pick it up. And this is, we've seen a lot of uh, foreign investors coming in, in particular the Chinese, uh, talking about a new uh, vision for Africa and a new mm. role that they have in Africa. In light of that, do you think that we've got a handle on the issues underlying ownership versus operatorship? And I know, Andrew, you were quite passionate about this earlier. Maybe let's get your comment in. Well, I think um, yeah, you've got to make that distinction between ownership and operatorship. And um, you know, I, I, there are plenty of examples of successful operators, whether it pertains to ports, railways, or um, you know, airports in Nigeria. But um, you know, at the end of the day, um, if you want to entice companies to come and invest, you've also got to have that support infrastructure as well around the asset. Um, and also a point that I brought up a little bit earlier, it's just um, a question of making sure that um, these transactions are, are, are processed properly um, and, um, and, and, and promptly a, a as well. Yeah. And um, again, I, th I think back of you know, the experiences of some of our clients that are keen to you know, examine some of these, um, these opportunities. Yeah. Um, but um, and, you know, I mean, you're never going to tick all the boxes in mm. terms of finding something which is perfect. But uh, there's still, you know, plenty of, you know, logistical challenges, administrative challenges associated with these projects, which, yeah. which need to be worked around. Richard, let's get a quick comment on you on the theme that also seems to be coming out of mm. multi-country um, projects. Is the regulatory environment conducive? I think it's moving in the right direction. Yeah. Um, one of the symptoms is a strong banking system um, in allowing investors to have a bit more security in terms of the movement of money. Um, in terms of technical regulation um, standards, there's a, a definite move in that direction. But I think um, there's still a ways to go. And together with the regulatory framework is also the, uh, the depth of expertise to be yeah. able to administer um, on an institutional level. Um, every single one of these projects sits within the domain of an authority, um, which is responsible for the, own, the ultimate ownership and stewardship of, of the project. Mm. And um, there needs to be considerable growth there as well. Right, right, right. Kunle, um, let me come to you and possibly for the last comment, and I'd want us just to talk about aviation very briefly. Um, we've seen a new uh, flight, uh, Kenya Airways, saying that they're now going to be flying from Nairobi uh, into Lagos, I believe, which is a positive development here in South Africa. There's murmurs of another low-cost carrier coming uh, to market, that's uh, Blue Crane. But let's talk about the prospects for aviation. How do we move forward so that we can become increasingly competitive and we can increase the number of flights that we see amongst African countries? Yeah, thanks. I think that's a good question. I think you know, the, the missing link for innovation is, is, is a poor airport infrastructure across Africa. Because, I mean, almost 20 years ago, we, we had the Yamasuku de Declaration, Open Skies in Africa, uh, and which we're already in, 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 that, in that space already. But the challenge is that even if you have Open Skies in Africa, if you have poor airport infrastructure, 
the turnaround time for airlines, the service on the ground is very bad, and therefore it makes it very difficult for airports, uh, airlines to be, to, be, to be profitable. Now, that airport infrastructure has to be, has to be invested and owned uh, and run by private investors because governments have, you know, really cannot, cannot run very large airports in Africa. That's my own, that's my own sense. I mean, apart from, from Joburg, for example, and maybe Cape Town, all the other airport, airports, whether it's Nairobi, whether it's Lagos, whether it's uh, Abidjan, Accra, second, second issue is that many airports are too small. The traffic coming into the airports is not, is not adequate for, for, for long haul traffic. So what you need to have in Africa is three, two or three very large air, airport hubs uh, that will take in the long haul traffic. And then, then, then from the long haul traffic, we then have regional or domestic traffic coming out of, the, out of the hubs. And for me, the national hubs would be Joburg, Lagos, and Nairobi. Mm. Now, the, in, in Nigeria, we've just been, we've just been you know, you know, dragging our feet about investing in either expanding the current airport or, or doing a, a brand new Greenfield Airport for Lagos, where we can take at least 5 million passengers. I mean, the, the one in Dakar, which, which hopefully is coming on stream very soon, is a 5 million passenger airport. But I still can't see the traffic you know, justification for that side of the airport in, the, in, 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 in Senegal. So, we need to have that airport infrastructure on the ground, yeah. you know, massive investment, run properly, professionally by in international operators, and then, you know, essentially the traffic will come. And hopefully the low cost airlines will then be able to make it much more economic for, for, uh, for flying right. in Africa. Kulia, thank you so much. Unfortunately, we've come to the end of this week's episode of Invest Africa. I feel like we've just scratched the surface of the transport infrastructure debate on the continent. Thank you to all my guests for making the time to join me. Up next is Bruce Whitfield, and he will be unpacking the latest news from South Africa's economy on Tonight with Bruce. Until next time, it's goodbye, and thank you for joining us.